we're going to do a prophecy update. I'm going to look a little bit again at um, the convergence of events again, and we see all of these things happening at this stunning, alarming rate that things are accelerating. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable what I see going on. Now, economic. You need to know this. This is the International Monetary Fund report, Taxing Times. This was reported last, oh, a few weeks ago in Forbes magazine, hardly a um, wacko publication or someone out there on the fringe. And what they're discovering is that all the countries of the world have a major debt problem. They've issued too much debt. They don't know how to pay off the debt. And the only way that they can figure out the payoff debt is to tax things. The problem, folks, is that if you taxed all of the richest people on the planet, like Peter and, and uh, Mike. And Peter finds that very funny. And, but if you tax the wealthiest people, like if you took the Forbes 400 or Fortune 400 richest people on the planet and taxed them 100%, took everything away from them, you would be able to run the United States government for about two and a half months. Then what do you do? So you can't tax just the richest to do it. You have to tax people. So to get debt levels back to what they call sustainability, not to improve the debt levels, but to get them where they think they might be sustainable for a while, the International Monetary Fund issued this report just in October, and this is what they said. The sharp deterioration of public finances in many countries has revived interest in a capital levy. A one-off tax on private wealth as an exceptional measure to restore debt sustainability. Now note that it's not to fix the debt, it's to restore debt sustainability. The appeal is that such a tax, if it is implemented before avoidance is possible, in other words, before you guys figure it out and hide your assets or convert them to cash so they can't get them, okay, that's avoidance, there is a belief that it will never be repeated does not distort behavior and may be seen by some as fair. There have been illustrious supporters uh, and until he changed his mind, Keynes is one of them. The conditions for success are strong but also need to be weighed against the risk of the alternatives which include repudiating public debt or inflating it away. These in turn are a particular form of wealth tax on bondholders that falls on non-residents. Now if you go read the Forbes publication, what Forbes says is this means they're coming, this is now mainstream among economic thought, they're coming after your 401k and retirement accounts. One time wealth taxes, sometimes 30 to 40 percent or more will be taken in a one time tax. Now does that, do any of you think that would affect your retirement plans? <coughs> do any of you think that that's fair? No. The, such is the world in which we live now. It won't fix the problem. What's that? And it won't fix the problem. And it won't fix the problem. It will only make them sustainable for a short period of time. Then what are they going to do? They'll do another one time. Well, they'll do another one time, and then you won't have anything left, and you'll be totally dependent on the cut on the government. Do not think that the rapid increase in people on food stamps is anything other than design for government control folks. If we live in the end times, you ought to be looking for the beginning. But you, I think there's been this belief among Christians that um, we're going to be raptured, then it gets bad. That's naive. I believe that all of the things that will happen and come to fruition after the church is removed, the really bad stuff, will be well on their way to happen. For example, apostasy in the church. That's going to be a bucket that's ready to overflow. It'll overflow like a flood and a tsunami when the church is gone, the true church is raptured out of here. But before it happens, it's all going to be in place. It's not going to just go from zero to a tsunami in that quickly. It's going to be building, and it's been building for years and years and years in folks in the evangelical churches. You'll see from some of the examples I'll give you in just a moment. It's here. Here's an example. Now, in looking for apostasy in the church, 
it's easy to spot some of it. So I'm going to give you some examples of some that's easy to spot, some that's probably going to look like you can recognize it, and some that's a little bit more subtle. This is Bill Johnson. He's pastor of Bethel Church in Redding, California. He is one of the New Apostolic Reformation apostles. Uh, this is one of the men when Todd Bentley, that tattooed goon down in, now in uh, South Carolina at the old Heritage USA, the Jim and Tammy Faye Baker place, uh, when he was having his Lakeland Revival, Bill Johnson was one of the ones that went there with John R. Knott. He was the, one of the big proponents of the Laughing Revival that went through the Vineyard Movement and the Charismatic Movement worldwide. It really was based on Kundalini Yoga, by the way. Uh, people, Kundalini Yoga practitioners who saw it said, well, that's, Kundalini, that's what people in Kundalini Yoga do. <laughs> and you can't distinguish between the two. He and Peter Wagner used to be the president of Fuller Seminary. Uh, and another of these other new, new Apostolic Reformation people went to Lakeland and they blessed Todd Bentley's ministry. You can watch the video on YouTube. And they, I've played it in here, and they said, you know, this, this man's going to have a great ministry. Four days later, Todd Bentley lost his wife and ran off with his mistress. He married her, and now she's prophesying with him in meetings down at Morningside Ministry, Rick Joyner's place there at the old Heritage USA. He's written a book called On Earth As It Is In Heaven, but he believes that there will be a great end-time revival, that he will be one of the apostles that leads that, uh, and that we live in the Elijah generation, and he's the one, one of the ones who's going to be like Elijah. Now, one of the things that Beth, uh, they have a school, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, and they take trips, and one of the places they go is they go to graveyards. For example, here's a picture of <laughs> Bill Johnson and some of the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry attenders at the grave of a charismatic guy in England named Smith Wigglesworth, okay? And what they are there to do, just like this one, is they go to graveyards, lay on the graves, and they get impartations of the spirit of the person who's dead. This is necromancy, spiritism, clearly prohibited by scripture, okay? This is easy to spot. Here's a picture of Benny Johnson, Bill Johnson's wife and fellow prophetess at the grave of Charles Finney up in, you know where his grave is? Oberlin, Westwood Cemetery in Oberlin. He was the president of Oberlin College. Now many people say Finney was a great evangelist. He was one of the guys responsible for the revival that took place in the Second Great Awakening. And this is his grave there at Westwood Cemetery in um, Oberlin, Ohio. He was president of o Oberlin University for a time. And one of the areas, the area that probably was uh, most affected by the Second Great Awakening historically in the United States, it started about 1790. Uh, Finney came on the scene. It was a lot of United Methodist or Methodist circuit riding preachers that got it started. It then went to Finney about 1825 to 1835. And it was really centered in western New York. You know, Buffalo is up here, Rochester, Syracuse over here. These are the Finger Lake regions. It, got, it was so effective that that area of New York was called the burned over district, meaning that there was no fuel for any further revival fire because everybody had gone through the Second Great Awakening. Those are county boundaries, yeah. This is the white area here is New York State. You know, Albany would be over here. I think Syracuse would be right here. Rochester was right on the eastern edge of the burned over district. Finney was a heretic. Finney did not preach or believe the gospel. You will hear many revivalists say that they follow Finney. Finney based things on emotion. He thought people could become perfect but he did not really believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so people have lost the history of what Finney really taught. And a lot of people now teach that Finney is okay. He was not, he was a rank heretic. 
He was based in Oberlin. He then, in 1835, he became president of Oberlin College. I believe he was the second president of that institution, which now is, as you know, one of the most left-wing institutions on planet Earth. And if you don't know that, now you do. Uh, very, very liberal college. And he was president there for about 20 years and then passed away. Uh, that institution was started by, I think it was the Second Presbyterian Church in Elyria, Ohio. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to build what they called then a New Jerusalem, a city of God in the wilderness. So they went out to Oberlin and they started this college. They wanted to build something like the kingdom of God on earth. Okay, So that's a little sidetrack. <coughs> But look, folks, it's this, this sign that people that go to Reading to Bethel Church are seeking for is what Jesus referred to as an evil and adulterous generation seeking for a sign. They look for that. As he said in verse 4 of Matthew 16, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. What happened at the time of Jesus' first coming is repeating itself at the time, as we get close to the time of Jesus' second coming. It's happening in many ways. People are looking for a sign, an experience of some kind. And you will hear fellowships of churches now talking about, we need to have more experiential theology. I can show you that in a publication. That is not Biblical. Now, how does it, and so we, we've seen one instance where it's very, very easy to see. How about an instance where it's not? I'm sure that some of you have seen these books, and your friends have read these books, and maybe you've read these books. One is by Pastor Steve Berger, a Calvary Chapel purser, per, uh, preacher, uh, I think somewhere in the Midwest, Have Heart, Bridging the Gulf Between Heaven and Earth, and then this Heaven is for Real, a little boy's uh, astounding story of his trip to heaven and back. Now these have received the endorsement of many well-known evangelical leaders. They're sold in Christian bookstores. I would um, be sur extremely surprised, they're bestsellers, if they're not sold at the uh, Lifeway store over there at Polaris. I would be surprised if they're not in most Christian or most bookstores and churches in the Columbus area. These books are false. This is not biblical. Not biblical. The only example in scripture of someone communicating with a real dead person was Saul with Samuel. And that was probably allowed supernaturally by the Lord. If you think you're communicating with a dead relative or a dead person, you are communicating with a demon. Demons are very clever, they will fool you and you see this um, guy on TV, I can't remember his name. He's been on Oprah, you know, he's the guy who had, always communicates with the dead and everything. That guy's demonic. <laughs> Avoid him. Avoid that type of thing. So this is one, though, but it becomes very mainstream, and it's a little more subtle. I mean, look at that cute little kid. How can you hate that cute little kid? Wendy? John, there's a passage in Luke 16 that's recently stuck out to me. Rich, dead rich man and Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And the story is that Lazarus, the rich man, is burning in hell and he wants Lazarus to come and drop his finger on his... Right, and Lazarus is also dead, although, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and so the dead man in hell said, well, send somebody back from the dead to my brothers and tell them that are still living. And God said, well, Abraham, Jesus well, yeah, yeah, they said, go ahead. If somebody from the dead, if they didn't listen to the prophets, then somebody, they're not going to listen to somebody from the dead coming back to tell them. Correct, they right, the right. They didn't believe, they didn't believe Moses. They're not going to believe someone coming back from the dead. That's a clear teaching of scripture. This is not biblical. When Paul was caught up to the third heaven, when he came back, he couldn't talk about it. And you see all these People on TV talk about, oh, you know, I went to heaven, God caught me up to heaven, I talked to blood. It's nonsense. It's demonic. Avoid it, okay? So that's a little bit more 
difficult. Now here's a story, this was in this week. Very popular pastor, Stephen Furdy, Elevation Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, started seven years ago when Stephen Furdy was about 25 years old, started with 14 people, now runs over 14,000 or 15,000 every Sunday. They have a whole bunch of different campuses. They have internet satellites. There's one in Cincinnati. There's one up in Norwalk, Ohio, where people meet and watch the services on Sunday. And uh, he, so nominally Southern Baptist, but you have to listen to this. This is a p aerial picture of the 16,000 square foot home that he's building in Charlotte. He has no board that he's accountable to at the church. It's mostly other pastors. And I want you to listen to this quotation of scripture from Perry Noble, who is one of the board members that gets to appoint his salary, okay? Perry Noble, speaking at the Code Orange Revival about a year and a half ago, this is a passage of scripture that he turns into a passage about Stephen Furtick. Here we go, Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 and 17. These were the verses that the Lord specifically, I'm telling you, specifically led me to for this church. Here we go, Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 and 17 says, But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For I tell you, many prophets and righteous men longed to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Elevation Church, you're blessed. You are blessed. Blessed because you know the scripture? No, you're blessed because Stephen Furtick is sitting here and is your preacher. That's exactly what he meant when he said that. Here's what the scripture says. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now that's the follow-up to a prophecy that <coughs> Matthew talks about from Isaiah that says this, the preceding verses. In their case... The prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. The, the disciples came to Jesus. Why do you speak in parables? Why don't you just speak clearly? And he says, okay, this is because it's a fulfillment of prophecy. You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. Your heart, you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and their, they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart in return, and I would heal them. That's from Matthew chapter 13, quoting the prophet Isaiah. But you see how he turns that into a passage about this pastor, this money preacher who's now building this massive home down there in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I don't begrudge anybody's success, but you need to understand that the church, Elevation Church, he says, well, I, I'm just spending money from the book profits, but all of the promotion costs of promoting the book have been paid by the church, by church contributions. He gets to keep all the profits and built a 16,000 square foot house, which he initially said in a public meeting, it was like, it's not that great a house. You know, it's really only 8,500 square feet under roof. He did, you know, I've got a big garage, I've got an unfinished basement. So it's, it's really not that great a house. They've lost their ability to reason. It will get worse in 2 Thessalonians 2. It says, for this reason, God will send them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that all may be judged and who do not believe in the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. I'm going to show you a couple examples of this. One from, um, and I'm pretty sure I got all of the words edited out, I apologize if I did. I went over them and over them and over them. Uh, this is from Bill Maher the other night. Al Sharpton, uh, Valerie Plame, Michael Moore, Bill Maher, talking about Christian fundamentalism and Islamism. Okay, now watch what happens. Valerie Plame will lead in. He says, Bill Maher was saying, Islam is different. They have people, they have suicide bombers. I mean, I, somebody saw a card this morning on the internet 
uh, it was somebody holding up a blank sheet of white paper and said number of Jewish suicide bombers. Okay. So watch this discussion. It's only a couple minutes long. Okay. Yeah, but they, now and now you have Christian dominionists that are just as extreme. Do, do they have do they have a whole farm system? Do they have websites? Do they, are, are there, are there, there no show me the country that has the Christian fundamentalist training camp where they're on the monkey bars? This is not just the same. One is herpes and one is cancer. Bill, I have to I have to disagree with you. Uh, look at what th there is a Christian dominionist, which is they. I put, you know, air quotes around Christians, uh, but they have a theolog they want to make a theocracy, and they have infiltrated the officer corps. Yeah, you're looking at me. Yeah. I am. I'm, yeah. I'm asking who they've killed or who they've threatened. I can guarantee you that right now there are Christians out there tonight that want to kill you and me. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't. Oh, you no, see, I think you're making an argument yeah, that is Islam that religion is... Or is that something else? Yeah. That, I mean, a lot of that is the culture, a lot of that... Is, is, is where you are. I don't think that's, you, you have all kinds of Muslims that have denounced some of the terrorism. This I don't think that is Islam. I think that is the distorted use of some, just like they are in any other religion, or atheist. Right. You know, so I'm you have disparity of power? But I could, I could, Bill, you bring, this up, you bring this up a lot, though, on, on the, and I'm just wondering, I mean, you seem to be, you've talked about this now for years. Um, you've <laughs> quoted it's from true. the Koran. You're right. I mean, it's, you're, you're very passionate. Uh, ab about this because it's a singular threat you know uh, Obama was asked I think it was by George Clooney once what what keeps you up at night and he didn't want to answer the question and he asked him again he demurred and he finally said Pakistan mm -hmm. why Pakistan why is it the one thing that keeps a president up at night could it be because there's the one country that's Islamist that has nuclear weapons it's crazy enough to use them well it beyond that it's not because of its Islamic but it's a country that is imploding you have the secret the security services are deeply infiltrated by al-qaeda and yes they have nuclear weapons that delusion we can kind of see now you need to be aware of this this is called the Kana initiative c-a-n-a -A initiative and it is uh, creating a healthy ecosystem for connection among Emergence progressive missional Christians. In the evangelical church, you hear the word missional all the time. Peter, did you ever, Mike, Peter, you guys went to seminary. Did they ever use the word missional when you were in seminary? It's a new word, folks. It has a meaning. It's part of this emergence Christianity. We're going to build the kingdom. We're going to make this a better world. Listen to what their initiatives are. The Kena Initiative seeks to translate critical thinking about the past and present into creative collective action for the future. And to do so in a spirit that is positive, ironic, that means uh, dominated by peace, sympathetic and generous. In this way, the Kenya Initiative seeks to support and encourage what is often called emergence Christianity. We welcome people from a wide spectrum of theological, political, and ethnic traditions except people who are going to call us on the fact that we're way off base biblically. We encourage a wide range of ecclesial structures, except people that really want a biblically based ecclesial structure. The Kenya Initiative sees the diversity as a sign of health and vitality. The Kenya Initiative brings together innovative leaders from all streams of the faith to collaborate in the development of new ways of being Christian, new ways of doing theology and living biblically, new understandings and practices of mission, new kinds of faith, communities, new approaches to worship, and spiritual formation, new integration, and convert conversations and convergences and dreams. Dreams, everybody's dreaming. The Kane Initiative participants share a sense of exploration, creativity, challenge, and opportunity in this pivotal and dynamic moment. Because we are rooted in a generous Christian heritage, we are eager to collaborate with people of other faiths and those seeking the common good, our networks of dialogue and action thus extend beyond Christian communities to persons of all faiths, as well as to communities that are not themselves faith-based. We welcome allies and allegiances wherever we find common cause. And you can flip over to the page and see the people that support it. Here's Phyllis Tickle. Here's, um, his first name is Simona, and I can't remember his last name, he's Pastor of a church in uh, New York. I'll show you him. Here's Tony Jones, one of the leaders of the Emergent Village. Spencer Burke used to be with Mariner's Church in California. Uh, Brian McLaren, Doug Padgett,
Christian Piott. Um, I'll talk about her in just a moment. And of course, one guy who always said, I'm not part of this emergent stuff. I'm not part, I'm not an emergent. Rob Bell. The book that this uh, Samir Simonovac wrote is called, It's Really All About God, Reflections of a Muslim Atheist Jewish Christian. <laughs> and then Brian McLaren, of course, and Doug Padgett are the two leaders. And the other one is a lady named Stephanie Spellers, Reverend Stephanie Spellers, from the Episcopal Diocese of Long Island. And this is on her Facebook page, Hello History at Stonewall Inn. And what does that mean? This is from June 26. What happened back in June? Supreme Court decision on gay marriage. What is the Stonewall Inn? That's where the Seminole, supposedly the New York City cops went in and killed a bunch of gay people. And it was a rallying point for the beginning of the gay rights movement in the United States. It's in New York City on the, I think down in the East Village. And so she is here saying, praise the Lord, gay marriage is okay. This is one of the three people identified as the leader of the Cana Initiative. Okay? And people will celebrate. Exhibit three, or four, whatever I'm up to. <laughs> the Mosaics Conference, 2013, November 5 and 6, takes place on Tuesday and Wednesday in Long Beach, California. It will be held the Multi-Ethnic Church Conference, sponsored by Fuller Seminary, Leadership Network, Gordon Conwell, on and on and on, all the people that are involved in the Emergent Church Movement. It's being held at this church. You see the labyrinth in the courtyard of this church? What church is this? The Long Beach Grace Brethren Church, folks. Wake up! This is acceptable in the Fellowship of Grace Brethren Churches. Do you understand how far we've gone, folks? Do you understand how dire the situation is? It is time, it is time to follow the admonition of Jude and snatch some people as if you're snatching them out of the fire. That's how bad it is. Labyrinths, mosaics, conferences, with people that know little about the Christian faith in your church, but dare you question practicing Christian yoga or spiritual formation, you have to go. Now, I don't talk about a lot, but this is a very emotional issue for me. You are witnessing the death of Christian organizations that used to stand for the truth. I could take you through articles today and show you things about Russell Moore, the new director of ethics for the Southern Baptist Convention, and talking about, oh, we don't need to be like Jerry Falwell and stand for all that conservative stuff, we need to reach out and partner with other people and have conferences with, with uh, Mormons. Ten years ago, if people had a conference with Mormons and dialogue and, and joint missions, we would have said they're crazy. And now everybody does it. And it passes. Listen. In Revelation chapter 2, and I don't have time to go into this, but uh, the admonition to the churches, the seven churches, all the seven churches got a report card. Only two had a good report card. Every church was surprised at the report that they got. And a number of them were extremely bad. The church at Laodicea was one. One was the church at Thyatira. In Revelation 2.18, John repeated this, and to the angel... And when he wrote Revelation, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds, 
and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. That's not a good thing. So if somebody promotes, say, you ought to go to a temple and eat a meal of the meat that has been offered to idols, you ought to quote this verse to them. This is the Son of God saying, that's not good. You're tolerating the woman Jezebel when you do that. That's evil. And it needs to be called evil. Middle East update. Folks, I only say this out of oh, these things I've only said today, I say out of concern, not out of pride or arrogance or anything like that. Trust me, believe me, that is not the case. Okay? I really want that to be clear. But you need to be aware of what's going on and how far things have gone. Now, Middle East update. We're going to look today at some things revolving around Israel. And I'm going to read probably really fast as we go through the last uh, 17 minutes or so of this presentation today. But know that this rebirth of the nation of Israel is an incredible fulfillment of God's providence and, and the prophecies that relate to the nation of Israel. In Isaiah 66, verse 22, it says this, For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring, talking to the Jewish people, and your name will endure. These people were sent into the nations, persecuted, uh, reviled, dispersed, and they kept their Jewish identity for two millennia till they were restored back to the land of Israel. Do you understand what an amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy that is? It's incredible. Verse four, Isaiah 49, verse 15, can a woman forgive her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? I saw there was a lady this week that had a 14 and a half pound baby. I'm sure she remembers <laughs> that event. And she will for the rest of her life. She said ultrasound said it was only gonna be 11 and this kid came out three and a half pounds above that. I've had nieces and nephews that weigh three and a half pounds at birth. And this list kid, uh, big kid, it looks like he's a year and a half old. And uh, even these may forget, but God says, I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Jeremiah 31, thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light be night by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Quote from the Lord, If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. In other words, as long as the moon comes up at night, the sun comes up in the day, the offspring of Israel will be a nation, will, will not cease from being a nation forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Now look, this, the promise to Israel was forever. God is faithful and in our lifetimes we've seen the rebirth, growth, and really the prominence of the nation of Israel and the Jewish people in many areas of public life. More Nobel Prizes than any other nation by far. And when you look at it on a per capita basis, it's off the charts. God has preserved his people, and you ought to take great comfort in that, that God will also be faithful to you to preserve you through similar times of trial and testing as a believer. <coughs> and what's going on? This is an interesting chart. My nephew told me about this. It was, came up in one of his classes in seminary. This is the sort of geographic center of the church, okay, through history. 
So, you know, it started in Jerusalem, right? Remember? Peter, Pentecost, all that. And you see how the, looking at the population of people on the globe, how the church center has changed. And back in the 70s, it started to change. Now, I don't think that this is accurate because it depends on how they calculate true Christians. There's major problems in the African church. Um, I read about a, a, a Nigerian bishop who has multiple mistresses and it currently has 10 women pregnant at the same time, who's a bishop in the Nigerian church. There's a lot of abuse in Africa. But the thing that you should take from this church is, where did the church start? The center? Jerusalem. Where is it heading back to? Jerusalem. As our friend Jacob Prash says, the first Christians were Jews, the last Christians will be Jews. And you're seeing it happen in our day. You're seeing things return back to a Middle East center thing. So, just a quick update. Look, this is an interesting article from the New York Times. Front page last Sunday morning, Rice, that's Susan Rice, the National Security Director now, offers a more modest strategy for the Mideast. Here's what she says. The President's goal, said Ms. Rice, who discussed the review for the first time in an interview last week, is to avoid having events in the Middle East swallow his foreign policy agenda as it had those presidents before him. We just can't be consumed 24-7 by one region. Important as it is, she said, he, the President, Obama, thought it was a good time to step back and reassess in a very critical and a kind of no-holds-barred way how we conceive the region, folks. As arrogant as he is, he has no choice that things are going to move back to the Middle East because that's what the Bible says will happen in the end times. Now, he may be arrogant enough to think that he'll get away from it, but I'm telling you, he will be drug in, as will every other world leader, over the next time until the Lord Jesus returns. It will be a Middle East focused. So these people out here, they're tilting at windmills if they think they're going to get out of it. Turkey. Turkey used to be a friend of Israel. Turkey blew Israel's cover, I think I mentioned this last week, on 10 uh, Mossad agents in Iran and told them who they were doing. And Lieberman, former foreign minister of Israel, says, let's stop deluding ourselves about Turkey. We need to really uh, talk about it. And the foreign minister of Turkey said, hey, I, we're only doing what we're supposed to do. You know, we had to identify these Jews. In fact, today, there was reports that Turkey may have helped out uh, Israel in, in bombing a Syrian weapons uh, depot this week. And they're saying, we would never help the Jews when they're bombing a Muslim nation. Saudi Arabia. This is melting down. Um, there's a tipping point. The, pri the uh, prince, the foreign minister prince of, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia has been openly critical of the Obama administration. It says this, New York Times, Saudi Arabia has abandoned its traditional policy of discretion in recent weeks, signaling deep anger at the Obama administration's Middle East policies and threatening to break with its most powerful ally and pursue a more robust and independent role in supporting the rebellion against President Bashar Assad, al-Assad of Syria. It's particularly galling for the Saudis to see their regional rival, Iran, has no such fears as it carries out a far more effective proxy war in Syria. It has deployed its Revolutionary Guards and the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah as far afield as Yemen to recruit jihadist-style fighters for the cause, who are then trained and equipped in Iran or Syria, American officials say. Syria is not the only Soviet grievance against the Obama administration. With Egypt, the Saudis were angry that Washington turned its, on its longtime ally, President Hosni Mubarak, and accepted the election of an Islamist, Mohammed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood. The strange thing about the crack up in U.S. Saudi relations is that it has been on the way for more than two years like a slow motion car wreck, but nobody in Riyadh or Washington has done anything decisive to avert it. The breach became dramatic over the past week. And You'll go on you'll see in that article that Saudi Arabia refused its seat on the Security Council. That was a direct slap. Now, where that might have practical impact against us is that 
Saudi Arabia is moving away from the United States may threaten the dollar as the reserve currency of the world, and that will have, if that happens, that will have a huge impact on us here in the United States. The cost of borrowing uh, to finance the debt of our government will go up. Inflation will become rampant. It will be hard to contain it. So that's why this is a significant thing. They started nuclear negotiations in Geneva a couple weeks ago. This is a report from CBS about that. Morning, Charlie. Well, the negotiators all arrived bang on time this morning. Uh, the Iranian team is being led by Iran's own foreign minister, Mr. Zarif, and the U.S. team by a senior State Department diplomat, Wendy Sherman. Uh, we hear that right after the meeting convened, the Iranians stood up with a PowerPoint presentation that laid out their compromises on their nuclear program. Shortly afterward, the meeting broke up, so all parties will be studying that very carefully. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Rouhani has changed his changed Iran's tune, really. That's unmistakable, not only with that uh, landmark phone call with President Obama, but also he's been pushing back at the hawks at home. He's told the Revolutionary Guard Corps, the very uh, anti-Western military force, to back off, to stay out of politics. He's been backed in that by Iran's supreme leader. So this is, a, this is an administration that wants to deal. Uh, however, it comes down to how badly do they want those sanctions lifted and what are they willing to give? We should know sometime in the next 48 hours. Charlie and Nora. Thank you, Liz. At least they're talking. The deception that is rampant in our world that they would trust the Iranians in anything is just, it's unbelievable. It's, it's almost beyond comprehension. But um, I suppose as we get closer to the end, we should have lower expectations of rationality from non-believers. I just think because the delusion is going to become so strong I hate to say that, but I think it's going to happen. But you know, folks, if that's the case, and you have all these churches that want to partner with all these non-believers to do good things, what's what's the result of that going to be? Is that going to propagate the gospel? Or is it going to water it down? It's going to water it down to the point where you won't even recognize it. That's what's going to happen. Now our next breaking story, Iran has long denied that it is directly involved in the Syrian civil war, but that, as you are about to see, is a lie. Tonight, CBS News has photographic proof that Iran's elite Revolutionary Guard is engaged in combat alongside Syrian forces to put down a popular revolt that began two and a half years ago. Here's why it matters. A human rights group reported today that the death toll there has reached 120,000, including nearly 43,000 civilians. And the State Department is telling us one third of Syrians have now lost their homes, the equivalent of 100 million Americans being displaced. We've seen rare pictures of Iranian advisors in Syria before, but we haven't seen them fighting like this. Elizabeth Palmer has the proof. Here they are, members of the elite Revolutionary Guards on the front lines of Syria's civil war. In this scene, the Iranians are taking the Syrians out into rebel territory on a reconnaissance mission. But what the men don't know as they get into position is that the rebels have spotted them and they've prepared an ambush. These are the rebels. They filmed their own offensive. And once they start shooting, the Iranians realize they're in trouble. Running out of ammunition and pinned down by enemy fire, outflanked. Suddenly, the camera goes to break. The cameraman and Commander Haidari were killed. And both were mourned at elaborate funerals back in Iran. And Elizabeth is joining us now in London. Elizabeth. What difference has the Iranian force made to the Syrian dictatorship in its fight against the rebels? Well, it's been decisive. Not only have uh, Iranian-backed militias turned the tide of fighting in the government's favor in several key battles, uh, but also this year alone, Iran has lent Syria more than $3.5 billion to buy oil, without which the country probably would have collapsed by now. An eye-opening story. Elizabeth, thank you very much. Iran is clear. There's proof, video proof now, that Revolutionary Guards are in 
Syria conducting war and operations. Here's an article from Caroline Glick, and I'll just uh, quickly go through this in the last few minutes. Obamacare victims in Israel was in the Jerusalem Post on Friday. And you need to look at this again in the context of the Bible, which says that Israel Middle East will be the focus of things in the end time. All throughout the Bible, the prophets dealt with nations in and around, touching on the nation of Israel. Now, all those prophecies sometimes have a future fulfillment to them. So if the nations that were affected by the, or in the prophets' prophecies were the nations around Israel, then where do you think those nations will be if the prophecies are going to be fulfilled in the future? They will be the nations around Israel. So you will see Persia, Iran, you will see those prophecies, Egypt, Egypt, all those prophecies are still have future fulfillment to them, but they relate to things in the Middle East. That's going to be the focus. So she says that sure there's an outcry now about Obama's dishonesty and the way he has used lying to take away from an unwilling public a right it would not have knowingly surrendered, but it is too late. There is no chance of revoking the law until 2017 when Obama leaves office. And by then, everyone will have been forced to accept what they consider unacceptable or be fined and lose all health coverage. Obama's mendacity is not limited to domestic policy. It operates in foreign affairs as well. Several commentators this week recalled Democratic Senator Robert Mendez's angry response to the Obama's administration's attempt to block Senate passage of sanctions against Iran in December 2011. As was the case with Obamacare, the White House knows that most Americans won't support its policy of doing nothing to prevent Iran from developing nu nuclear weapons. So the White House never says that this is its policy. Obama and his advisors insist that preventing Iran from becoming a nuclear power is the central goal of the administration. But their actions move U.S. policy in the opposite direction. And if they get caught on the lies after Iran gets the bomb, well, Obama won't be facing re-election, so he will pay no price for his duplicity. The mendacity at the heart of Obama's political playbook is something that Israel needs to understand if it is to survive his presidency without major damage to its strategic viability. The events of the past week make it clear that the stakes in understanding and exposing his game couldn't be higher. There were a number of developments. They've had, there was a PLO position paper that was released, and this position paper says, lays out what the Palestinians really are going after in their peace negotiations. Listen to this. In a nutshell, the paper requires Israel to destroy itself demographically, democratically, militarily, legally, and politically, and that it relinquish its water supply. Six months after it does all these things, the Palestinians will agree to sign a peace treaty with it. The Palestinian document claims not only all of Judea and Samaria, the mountains of Israel that are talked about in the prophecies of Ezekiel 35 through 37, except for 1.9% of the territory that Israel can keep in exchange for money and more land within sovereign Israel, and eastern, northern, and southern Jerusalem. It demands the northern Negev, the Hula Valley, Latrim, and the Elah Valley, and it demands them all free of Jewish precedents. Where's the Elah Valley? What, what biblical event happened in the Valley of Elah? Anybody remember? David and Goliath. We don't care. We want it. It's ours. That's what the Palestinians say. They demand that Israel relinquish its rights under international law to Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem by agreeing that they are occupied. They demand full control over the airspace over Judea, Samaria, Gaza, and Jerusalem, and over the waters of the Gaza, off the Gaza coast. They demand an end of Air Force overflights of those areas. They demand control over all the underground aquifers and over the electromagnetic spectrum. Sounds like they're, they're, they're negotiating. I think they're negotiating like... The Iran, Iranians are going to negotiate. Moreover, the Palestinians are demanding that Israel allow 5 million foreign-born Arabs the right to freely immigrate to its remaining territory. They refuse to accept Israel's right to exist and claim they have sovereign rights over all of Jerusalem. The Palestinian document reveals there is no chance whatsoever that the current negotiations will lead to peace. PLO Chief Mohammed Abbas and his cronies don't want peace, they want to destroy Israel. And they're talking about if you don't agree to this, 
we're going to do another intifada. And yet, in light of this, there are people, this was some articles, uh, Jim Fletcher, uh, great columnist, uh, writer on this topic, he's been dogged on the growth of Christian Palestinianism, as has uh, Paul Wilkinson, talks about Lynn Hywels, the wife of Bill Hywels, founder of Willow Creek, uh, her participation along with other so-called evangelicals at the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference, another one coming up here in March of 2014, and this belief that Israel is the cause of all the Palestinian problems. It is based on people who are falling to the deception and delusion of the end times. That's the only explanation for it. I think I'm going to wrap up here. Next week we'll start with a video that shows you why Israel could not possibly do or should not do some of the things that they do because of the geographic area of Israel. I, some of you probably have seen this video, but I think it's worth uh, repeating here. Folks, I really, I say this every week, and I hope I don't, you don't think I'm beating a dead horse uh, or that I'm, you know, uh, chicken little or that type of thing. I do think this is a significant time in prophetic history. God is bringing all of these things to bear. Uh, there were a number of people on TV the other night, uh, including Bill Salas, a friend of mine, talking about, folks, you need to look at what's going on. It is, this is it. And these are not wild-eyed, wild -eyed, crazy people, okay? These are rational people that have been faithful in studying the scriptures and have come to the conclusion that God is wrapping up his prophetic time clock as we watch as we happen now. Will it happen in five years, two years, one year, ten? I don't know. All I know is I don't think there's any turning back at this point. I think we've reached the tipping point, and that means that, as I say every week, we need to prepare ourselves for a time of trial, testing, and persecution. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. You need to repent of your sins, believe the gospel, believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, took all of the sins as your penalty, <clears throat> died as a sacrificial lamb in your place so that you could have a relationship with God. You get that by repenting of your sins. And the rest of us who have repented of our sins, we need to live holy lives in preparation and anticipation of the soon, or shall we say, the quick return of Jesus. Because when Jesus, when things start to unfold, Jesus says, I'm not coming back soon. He says, I'm coming quickly. So when things begin to happen, they're going to happen really fast. And they're already happening, and they're accelerating right in front of our eyes. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for your word. Thanks for your prophetic word. Thanks for the ability right now to share these things freely, talk openly about these things. Lord, pray that you will protect all of us, keep us in your hand. Help us live lives in anticipation of your soon return. And Lord, if there's anybody here today that has not accepted you or that might listen to this recording later, Lord, please bring them someone that will share the full gospel with them, that will tell them how to repent and to become a child of God and to enter into that glorious relationship with you both now and then in that future time uh, in the new Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom. Lord, bless us as we go this day. Watch over us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.